it strikes me that we can look at the world in several ways. So we know um, that two billion people um, have been brought out of material poverty in the last 20 years, although six to 700 uh, million remain. Um, we know the proportion of malnourished people has come down from 23% in 1990 to the 13% in 2015. That 100 million kids out of school in uh, 2000, and 57 million today, and the gender gap is closing. Um, under five child deaths per year, down by six million a year, from 12 million to six million. That's six, still six million. <coughs> and maternal, maternal mortality down from, from 30, 380 per 100,000 um, to 210 in the last 15 years. So we could say the world is a, is, a, is a better place and a continuing better place. We also have a view of the world that inequality is driving uh, a lot of uh, our problems. I don't know if any of you have listened to the Boyer lectures in the last few days, the first two of the Boyer lecture series which are about health but they're looking at the causes of, of bad health and inequality as a driver of, of, of poor health. Um, and of course, we've got the issues of how politics, climate change, um, and insecurity are increasingly coming together. Um, and I came across this graphic, this picture, which I found quite extraordinary, that Naomi Klein used in a recent article. So this is, um, the, the, the red line is the 200 meter aridity line around the Sahara. It's basically the limits to cultivation uh, if you like. And these dots are the focus of Western drone strikes in the last um, two years. There's a remarkable correlation. Now, correlation, of course, doesn't mean causation. But the fact that the instability along that aridity line is very, very high is, is an interesting question to ask. And the fact that Dara, which is where Syria's deepest drought on record, brought huge numbers of displaced farmers in the years leading up to the outbreak of the Civil War, was also the place where the Syrian Civil War started. This isn't to say that climate change is, or, or, or water shortage in particular in these cases is a driver, but it is arguably a very important contributing factor. <coughs> now, when we started this course, I started, uh, started thinking about this course, I started collecting snippets of uh, news. And so I'm just going to run through the news for the last 18 months. Charlie Hebdo in Paris. Um, Slavov Zizek, one of those uh, slightly weird Eastern European uh, philosophers, um, says, how do you account for the fact of a massive socio-political movement whose main aim... Um, so how do you collect for the fact that the main aim is the hierarchic regulation of the relationship between the sexes? Um, why do Muslims, who are undoubtedly exposed to exploitation, domination, and other destructive and humiliating aspects of colonialism, target in their response the best part, for us at least, of the Western legacy, our, our egalitarianism, personal freedoms, including the freedom to mock all authorities. And his answer is, one answer is that their target is well chosen because the liberal West is so unbearable, because it, can only, because it not only practices exploitation and violence domination, but presents this brutal reality in the guise of its opposite, freedom, equality, and democracy. So a very interesting take on an event that, that drove quite a lot of discussion. Why is it that sexual rights are at the center of many discussions on progress and social change? From Uganda, Russia, Ethiopia, Malaysia, whilst at the same time there is a remarkable shift in attitudes in most of the Western world, symbolized, apart from in Australia, um, on the recognition of same-sex marriage. Recent laws in Russia, supported by Vladimir Putin, seek to penalize propaganda of homosexuality and link it to Western interests in a very cynical manner. So why is this at the fault line of a lot of exchanges between countries? Boko Haram, another example in a different part of the world of a similar phenomenon. And closer to home, Tonga, um, for those of you who didn't follow this, as, as legislation for the ratification of CEDAW um, was progressing in Tonga, um, 
church authorities and others came out on the streets, and something like 20,000, 30,000 people, which in Tonga is a lot of people, um, crowded onto the streets of Tonga Tapu um, to protest. Um, was this driven actually by what people were talking about, which was this is the slippery slope to same-sex marriage and uh, abortion, or was it actually about protecting the nobility and inheritance rights to land? And this is where the politics of how this stuff plays out becomes quite interesting. Of course, a few months later, we have the launch of the Sustainable Development Goals. As Bill Easterly say, said at the time, he called them the SDGs, stupid, dangerous, and garbled. <laughs> but what is it? What might be transformational about the SDGs in, in this kind of world? Is it the fact that getting to zero and eliminating absolute poverty is, is a, is, it would be transformational because it would mean addressing inequality? Is it the conceptual pivot away from the fact that these apply everywhere in Australia as much as anywhere else and therefore changes the narrative about aid and development to one of common problem? Or is it because they bring the social and environmental together for the first time in really important ways? I think there are these important questions for us. But if they are a global log frame, then it's arguable that they're not going to achieve that transformation. But if they're about a normative agenda for change, then perhaps they might be. The same month, this picture galvanized an extraordinary reaction. But as we've seen a year on from this picture in the commentary this week, what's changed as a result? Nothing. How temporary is our kind of uh, fixation on the media and pictures, and how, 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 what, how does that play out? The Olympics and Zika, Zika is obviously not the, the, uh, the it just reminds us of the increasing interdependence and the possibility of pandemics which remain possible. SARS 2003, do you remember that? H1N1 2009, Ebola outbreak in West Africa. They're actually all symptoms of a connection, but in the case of Ebola in particular, they're symptoms of where health systems are weak and where uh, our inability, our interconnectedness makes us vulnerable and points out that where poverty um, and systems and institutions are weak, they have a, a contagious effect. So, Mr. Duterte, who um, I think this morning has, has said uh, the, kicked the US uh, special forces out of the south of the country. Um, he's also picking a fight with China over the Spratly Islands. Um, and a part, and uh, arguably, the return to strong leaders is not just seen in the Philippines. Um, we're seeing it, we've certainly seen it in parts of Africa, uh, we've seen it in parts of East Asia, we're potentially seeing it in other parts of the world. And there is a view that this is not just about populism, but it also delivers, uh, authoritarian leadership can deliver development results, economic growth and health services, as David Booth's work um, on the Africa Power and Politics program shows. So what does this mean for us, this return to strong leaders, authoritarianism? Orlando, the killing of, uh, I think it's 49 um, people at the, the gay nightclub, Pulse nightclub. Um, if you've listened to, and I, I love this program, the, 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 the Minefield with Wally Daly and the rest of it. I don't know if you've heard this episode on Orlando, but it's really interesting because what they're picking apart is how everyone jumped on this to justify their own claim. So for Trump, um, this was used to reiterate the call for temporarily banning Muslim immigration. Um, for arms control groups, is the opportunity to say control arms. Um, for the Islamic State, they claimed the killing because that fitted with what they wanted. Those that argued for tougher border security argued their case. And for some, it was an indiscriminate act of terrorism. For others, it was an attack and a sex crime against the LGBTI community. And there's a very interesting, in Britain, Owen Jones, a gay activist, walked off a TV show as he wasn't allowed, as he was claiming this as a, an attack on gay people. And the commentator said, this is an attack on all of us. Now, this, this 
balance between identity politics, common, the common good, is becoming uh, quite a fracturing thing. And arguably, this culminated in Britain, where commentators think three things drove <laughs> Brexit. One, inequality. It's very clear that the people that voted leave were poorer, uh, less educated, whiter uh, than those that voted stay, and older. Um, very, very clear. But to, to call this group a bunch, or four, well, all but one, well, one million more people, 51% uh, who voted, um, to call them all xenophobes, is arguably missing something deeper. Um, and certainly, commentators suggest that there are three potential explanations. One is inequality, the second is identity. So a lot of the rhetoric was about controlling our borders, bringing back control. And the third was immigration. You, it was absolutely clear that immigration was a, a really hot issue here uh, as well. And some have argued further that this is the start of a process of deglobalization that what we're seeing now is the result of Thatcher, Thatcher and Reagan's neoliberal agenda playing itself out um, as wages collapse in, in for the middle class. Of course, closer to home, uh, this, I don't know if you've followed the complexity of the South China Sea, but it is mind-bogglingly, bog 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 I can't even say it. Um, so this is what the China claim because if the Spratly Islands and Paracel Islands are Chinese, then they extend those waters to include the oil fields down in this part of the world and the five billion worth of trade, world trade that goes through this area. And of course the Philippines claim, and have recently won in The Hague, their claim to the Scarborough Shoal um, and parts of the Spratly Islands, which China of course has, has um, uh, denied. So is this a flashpoint for something, area? What is it, where does it place Australia? In an interesting position where what, what we start to see now is headlines about bombers that are now capable from these islands um, of reaching the Australian territory. Turkey. Um, clearly this is a knock-on effect of Syria and an authoritarian leader that is that has, uh, becoming increasingly so. Um, and it's related to Kurdish groups in Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and how they are allied to forces uh, there. But also, within Turkey, the story is this is actually also about the Israeli, uh, the pro-US and Israeli Gulenist movement, uh, the guy that is actually in the States now, and that this is actually a Western-supported coup. Um, whereas for, in the Western media, this has been all about an authoritarian media using a, a, a coup to then uh, get rid of several thousand opponents in civil society. And of course, all of this arguably is playing out here in, in different ways, whether it be the inequality uh, typified by the gaps in health uh, between indigenous groups and incarceration rates, whether it be about banning Muslims and immigration questions, Arguably, inequality, identity, and immigration are playing out here in arguably similar ways. So what, and the five, I've, I've gone forward a little bit here. Um, how is it possible that the, we are so close to two potentially radically different possibilities? If Trump wins, there's a radical possibility of some quite serious um, international turmoil, one would argue. If he doesn't win, what is that group going to do? What is going to happen to the Republican Party as that collapses? What is that going to do to international politics uh, much more broadly? So there's, it's, it's, it's quite extraordinary that so, there's so little difference between two very different possible outcomes. But it's not all gloom and doom. Um, so Steven Pinker, I don't know if you know his work, which is about the decline of conflict between people over the long term. And he's updated those figures recently and shows that that continues to be the case. And it is very clear that the data on war deaths in particular 
and violence overall has declined dramatically. And if you, it, depending on the historical period you use, actually, the further you go back, the better it gets. Um, so there is clearly something important. And, and Pinker suggests there's a couple of explanations why we think the world is falling apart. There's, he speaks of, um, of co who are the psychologists in the room? We did have some. So, availability bias, apparently, <laughs> is a term invented by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, those people that talk about thinking fast and thinking slow, according to which we judge risk by how easy it is to remember examples. And so, that's why that picture of, of, of uh, Ilo, Alan Kurdi and others, we remember that because of the visual images in France, in France and we can remember that well. <laughs> Um, and we also have a moral bias, so a bias to, 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 to wanting to see um, good things happen. Um, and for the public, he says, you have to think clearly, you should not base your view of the world on images because they're not an accurate indicator of the shape of the world. So all I've just shown you, you can throw out the window. And Ian Morris, for those of you who don't know, Ian Morris is a guy who looks at the long term. And when I say long term, he looks at 20,000 year. Uh, he's an archaeologist, um, historian. Um, so he's looked at these questions of how different societies um, look at change. So he, and his argument is that actually it's the capture of energy and how, how well we capture energy that actually drives a lot of our views about inequality, hierarchy, uh, uh, gender. So his argument is that actually foraging societies, because they capture very low amounts of energy in small groups, were actually highly egalitarian. Uh, that that changed when farming systems evolved, because you were allowed to capture more energy, you needed more hierarchical systems to build pyramids and aqueducts, etc. And that the fossil fuel age is actually less um, unequal than the farming age. So it's interesting. Again, you take the longer scale, but his. The nicest part of this, and I don't know if you've seen this. This is this is an ad advert for Ford. Introducing Australia's four by four. Sorry, I got two seconds of this. So, a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study, uh, and so this the, the, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more because after we did this about ten years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group, they know each other, we take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do, and if you give both of them cucumber, for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. <laughs> and so if you give them grapes as a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece he eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now. Gets again cucumber. Again. 
So this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. <laughs> so, so Ian Morris's argument is that actually we are hired, we, we and other mammals are, high, are hardwired for a degree of fairness. But what we mean by fairness in different societies and at different times changes. Um, I think it offers quite interesting possibilities for us to think about what, what that means. But the his second point, though, about energy is something I think is becoming increasingly clear, is that the questions of how new forms of energy, and particularly energy storage, and how, what that might mean, not just for renewable energy, but for how that changes incentives for the, electric, the production of electricity much more broadly, is potentially a huge game changer. Um, so the role of technology and energy technology in particular is clearly key in change processes, but the question of who owns that technology, et cetera, et cetera, becomes critical. And of course, there is a view, and uh, Paul Mason in his recent book suggests that actually the role of technology and the rise of uh, sharing eco the sharing economy, um, whether that be uh, the example of Wikipedia, uh, if you like, is actually driving changes to the economy that fundamentally undermine the rules of capitalism. Now, we can debate whether he's right or wrong, but there is a view that there's interesting how technology social processes and how they combine can shift things in quite dramatic ways. Um, and his argument is that capitalism can't survive if its primary res resources are available at little cost and with almost limitless shelf life. Abundant information is currently both too valuable and too cheap for an economic model based on private property to endure. And finally, this is a graph um, I'll have to explain it. So this is growth in, 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 in income change uh, from 1988 to 2008. Okay? And the bottom line is the percentile of global income distribution. So this is the poorest people in the world, and these are the richest people in the world. So the change in income over that period um, for the poorest people, possibly 15% over a 20-year period. For the richest... Uh, purchasing power parity of $180 a day, it's more like 60, 55, 60, but that's not the highest. The highest changes are around China and India's middle classes. Those people that have lost out the most are arguably US and British, lower middle class groups, precisely the people that voted for Brexit, precisely the people that have voted for Trump. So this, I find, quite an interesting explanation, possibly, of what's going on. Um, but you may not. So what we'd like you to do now, having thrown that at you, is have a discussion at your table. How, how do you react to all of that? Are you confused? Are you angry? Are you sad? Are you motivated? Do you want to go home? Do you want to cry? Have a chat. 